This is John Reed. I'm joined by a familiar podcast guest from days gone by, Vijay Vijaya Sankar. How are we doing? Very cool. Great to be back with you here. Been a while. Oh my goodness. I was trying to remember when the first time we did a podcast together was. I, I, I'm going to say something like 17 years, but I'm Easy. not even Easy, sure. Right? It's 15, 17 years ago, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, but oh my gosh, what a journey, right? And now we're on a whole different phase of it. And the, our focus today is on a topic I think you and I are both passionate about enterprise AI and, and the realities of enterprise AI projects. Oh my gosh, what a time we are living in now. Never been a more exciting time. I mean, that's the beauty of technology, right? Almost any day you can say that there hasn't been a more exciting time because things are getting exponentially more interesting, right? Every day. Indeed, and you wrote a you wrote a post, uh, and and we're going to get into that on Gen AI, Gen AI and the enterprise, and just just for a little context for our listeners, uh, VJ runs the financial services uh, area for IBM, and so the context for today's podcast, you're going to be drawing on like your knowledge, which comes from that particular industry. I think that's important to point out because there are. You know, AI does vary quite a bit in terms of industry nuances and compliance and, and customer adoption, eagerness and stuff like that. So just something to keep in mind in terms of how we approach this topic today. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it is correct that I am the managing partner for the financial services consulting business, but just want to make clear that today I'm just here as Vijay, the person, right? Just offering some personal opinions, not IBM's opinions. Yeah. Indeed. And, you know, I think, I think you and I, while we, we certainly probably have our differences, we also have a lot of similarities around this topic and that I think you and I, we, we're straddling a, a, a tricky fence sometimes between like wanting to really push the brakes on a lot of the BS and the hype that we see around AI. But then there's also this feeling of potential and optimism. And like, I don't know about you, but like not even enterprise, but just AI in general, it just feels like. Pandora's box or whatever. Like, I don't think we, we can't put this back. So what we have to do is figure out how to make this technology, make humanity a better place to be and work a better place to be because we can't put it back. You, you, you cannot put it back. You have to be responsible, but also on the other hand, right? I mean, technology by itself is neither good nor bad, right? I mean, the more interesting things it can do, uh, in the wrong hands, it can do a lot of harm as well, right? Like a nuclear reactor generating power, right, for our city is a good thing. A nuclear bomb is a terrible thing, right? But roughly same technology, same physics, right, that, that gets applied. So that concept we always have to keep in mind, right? The reason, um, you know, we have this conversation is just to make people aware that as much as the excitement happens uh, because of technology, there are a lot of pitfalls as well. And, you know, if you don't watch out, uh, then, as John mentioned, right, you cannot put that genie back in the bottle after it's unleashed. Well, and I think the other interesting thing, too, is there's a lot of technologies in the enterprise where you can kind of study it if you want to. Like I studied blockchain a fair amount, but it didn't really become mainstream. I studied the metaverse quite a bit so I could debunk it. We all have to study AI. We all have to dive into this topic. I think we have a collective responsibility to do it for ethical reasons, but we have to do it for jobs too, right? Because if if you can't work easily and effectively with these tools, someone else that can is probably going to be taking your place, you know, before too long. So we all need to get a handle on this. Yeah, and it is it is super important. Right? Even if you know your job is not under threat, you still need to have an appreciation for AI as a as a consumer, right? So that you know you learn to protect your your privacy and and other things, right? So just having a general appreciation for it uh, is good, even if you have nothing about your you know professional life attached to it. Uh, it's still good to have a a great awareness on this. And you know, I think you've taken some flack at times for being perhaps critical of AI hype. We know this, right? But but I think what's interesting, and and I've taken some of the same. What I what I keep talking about is the need for precision. That that I want to have a precise discussion about enterprise AI. What works, what doesn't, what the drawbacks are, how we can compensate for them, what the limitations are. I want to have that conversation. And I feel pretty strong about this because every time I talk to a customer, I feel like they want to have that same conversation. 
Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And there are a ton of differences, right? So enterprise AI has an advantage over general purpose, let's say consumer AI, right? For want of a, a better phrase to define it. Uh, a client, right? A, a human being, right? Their experience or expectations are set with their last great experience. So if your introduction to AI or generative AI is from chat GPT, that becomes your base expectation of everything else that you work with from that point forward. Now, an enterprise context um, doesn't need that level of um, effort or should not come with that level of risk and, and, and so on. So uh, a good example, right? You can you know, have AI generate an essay or a poem on your cat. And it's completely fun to do. I have done all kinds of interesting things. Um, there are some things that fail too, you know, like my favorite example is, can you spell lollipop backwards? And it usually gets it wrong. And the one time it will get it right, if you just tell the, the, the system, oh, it's wrong, even when it's right, it will apologize and try to give an even more, you know, screwed up version of the answer. So it's all fun, right? So as a consumer, AI can be a, a, a lot of fun, right? Play, playing with it. But, and it can make up, you know, completely wrong answers, you know, what the industry refers to as hallucinations and so on. None of these are particularly good things to have in an enterprise context. Now, what does an enterprise want, right? Enterprise has such limited, narrow use cases. So it doesn't need, and plus it needs to be cost effective. It needs to be risk mitigated, uh, highly secure, you know, compliant with assorted regulations and so on, especially since I work in financial services. So it puts a ton of restrictions compared to uh, to consumer AI. So the expectations have to be reset on what this thing is supposed to do. Um, and, you know, just like when big data was a thing, uh, the big question was how big does the data need to be before you call it big data? Right? For some companies, you know, 100 terabytes is, is big. 100 petabytes is big for someone else, right? But we refer to it as, as big data. You know, the same problem is happening with uh, large language models. How large is, is large? How many billion parameters, you know, uh, do you expect? And, and so on and forth, so forth, right? So some expectation level setting is needed when you talk about AI or generative AI, which is, you know, the current topic, right, in, in the enterprise context. And I think that's where the work needs to start, right, in resetting that context, that enterprise context is a much smaller context than the general purpose consumer world. And consequently, a lot of things that can go wrong um, in a general purpose AI can be mitigated somewhat, right, in the in the enterprise context. But if you don't have that awareness, yeah. you'll be disappointed from day one. Right. And in your blog post on your and VJ says blog, you published Gen, I, Gen AI and the enterprise nine themes I have seen so far. And we're going to go into your post a bit and why you wrote it. But one of the things I was struck by is you talked about a few times in the past, in the last 25 years, when you've seen this kind of massive interest in being a first mover, you talked about when ERP helped consolidate applications, when data warehousing became mainstream, when mobile and cloud converged as your other three examples. And I think what's kind of interesting about the generative AI example is that in the past, the enterprise really felt like a technology laggard in really counterproductive ways. Like you think about mobile, for example, and how one of the famous examples that I love was how Robert Scoble at one point uh, got so incensed that he had to use this expense management uh, tool from a corporate vendor because he had like this Expensify app that was so much easier and better to use. Right. And it was this classic example of like, my my apps, my consumer apps are so easy. And my enterprise app sucks so much, right? And so the enterprise has always kind of had this this reputation for for kind of being clunky and behind consumer tech. Now, granted, people like you and me would say yes, but it's solving much more complex problems. But still, the the usability was like really exposed, right? And but when you look at AI and enterprise AI, I think the fascinating thing is the chance for the redemption like of enterprise technologists and people like you and me that care about this because the exact things that AI needs, this generation of AI needs to be more effective, things like explainability, uh, you know, uh, data privacy, bias reduction, 
you know, compliance, all these things are actually the kind of guardrails the enterprise actually obsesses about and is good at. So maybe this is finally a chance where the more deliberate pace of the enterprise actually comes as an advantage, you know? Totally, right? I mean, I'll tell you this example of when IBM rolled out um, an HR chatbot, right? What we call Ask HR. Now, as as an executive, yeah, I very rarely had to touch an HR system directly, right? I'm a casual user of HR systems. Like when I have to promote somebody or I have to transfer somebody, you know, that's when I need it. And I would usually take the help of my HR partner to get those things done. And then recently, as in a few months ago, uh, I had to transfer someone, right, from one team to another. Um, and, you know, I don't exactly remember anymore. You know, I was an SAP consultant and, you know, I have worked on Workday and Oracle and so on several times, but it's been a while, right? So I no longer know the navigation on these things, which I'm sure has gotten much better from the time that I was a consultant. But nevertheless, I could, my HR partner told me that, hey, why have you tried the chatbot? I was very, very, very skeptical, right? I mean, what's the chatbot going to do, right? Probably will give me two pages of instructions and then I have to, you know, go figure this out myself. But it was so stupid simple that took maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds or something, John. All it said was, who is the employee? I put it in. Who is the manager to which this employee needs to report to next? What date? Click, click, click. And it said, it's done. Now, I have no idea what happened behind the scenes, right? I'm sure some API got called and... You know, it all it all happened just fine. And just out of curiosity, I called the receiving manager just to check if hey, did this thing actually happen? Did this employee show up in your um in your tree? And she confirmed, yeah, it, it did. And she was pretty stunned too that I managed to do it. Because I'm I'm not a, a particularly savvy HR user, right? Now it solves them. So that's a, a an easy example to to prove that a ton of these things, right? Um procurement transactions and, you know, like if I want, you know, office supplies, you know, printer cartridge or something, there is no reason for me to understand like Ariba configuration, right? To to go and figure out how to order. I'm sure it is not complicated, but if you can just talk, right? As in, in English and say, I want to order two cartridges and it just gives me an option. I say, yes, and it orders it for me. More power, right? I mean, look at the amount of effort that can be avoided. Um, that's the kind of use that AI brings to enterprise that we historically never had, right? And this uses a sophisticated set of things, right? There's natural language processing and other regular API invocation that we have all done, you know, forever. But all these things coming together with a good product management mindset, it's just tremendously useful, right? I, you don't, otherwise it, it's very frustrating for, for many enterprise users, right? These things that you do like three times a year, right? You don't want to spend one hour figuring out, you know, how, how to work it. So, yeah, I think usability is one of those things that AI will improve our quality of life tremendously. So I, we can get into this more at some point perhaps, but I, I insist upon calling this more of an evolutionary than a revolutionary technology. And, and we could debate that a little bit in the sense that if you take a 20-year span – then I think it probably is revolutionary, but I'm just saying in terms of the day to day. And I think your example of HR is really good because what isn't possible right now is having that digital AI assistant that follows you around all day long, no matter what you're doing and solves everything for you, right? It makes theater ticket reservations on the one hand. It helps you with a work problem on the other hand. It's like always there for you. What I think you just outlined is a key to success in enterprise right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's having a little bit of a narrow focus around like, okay, I've got some a bunch of HR problems that I really want busy managers like VJ to be able to solve without having to go into the system. And that seems like a really fruitful approach for a use case. Or in the case of your financial services customers, I'd love to hear more about how you work with them to identify pain points, but I assume it's a similar type of thing where you talk about, you know, what would make your life a lot easier and and what's feasible, right? Like that narrow focus really, really helps play to the strengths of, of these current tools. Yeah. So I'll give you an example from financial services, right? So the moment anybody thinks about banks, for example, right? So financial services for us is banking, 
um, capital markets and insurance, right? So let's take banking because that's a one industry that probably vast majority of people have some appreciation for. Banks are, you know, worried every day on whether they stay compliant and the cost of compliance is a is a big difficulty in this industry in general because the number of laws and the complexity of those laws right it only increases over time right there's nobody in banking who wakes up and says that i'm pretty sure in 10 years this will be much more simple no in 10 years it will be you know more over regulated than it is now that's just the trend and it's not a bad thing right we do need to protect people and you know uh, laws are a good thing but how do you know whether you're in compliance? Just the sheer amount of effort to you know, validate that you're compliant, it's a very expensive uh, undertaking for banks. Now, yeah, and it's not like there is one regulator, right? There are so many regulators, FDIC and SEC and OCC and so on, right? Assorted acronyms, right? Standing for very powerful regulators. They all have different laws, sometimes overlapping, hopefully not too much uh, in contrast with each other. But, you know, all these things are possible. Now, if a, a bank president wants to check on something, right, they would typically hire a, a compliance specialist firm to come in and check this out. They will need to send very senior people who all bill uh, an incredibly high amount of money. Um, now, to be fair, we do that business too. So, you know, I'm not complaining, you know, and if people are spending money on this, you know, probably is a good thing for us. But that said, right, jokes apart, what if an AI system is capable of understanding compliance so that a less experienced person, still somebody with domain experience, but not the highest experienced person um, working with AI can do the same thing as what the most experienced person does? Think about the scale and the efficiency that it will um, come back with. And you don't need to know as much about the nuances because AI is capable of summarizing those nuances and you can do a little Q&A with it. And you can come to, and maybe the result is you do need to go and ask an expert, right? But probably 80% of the time you can find the answer yourself in the combination of the less experienced person working with AI. Those can, so it's a very narrow use case but something that you know is applicable in every bank every day of their life right so that is the kind of advantage that ai and automation gives uh, we should stop thinking in terms of is it going to solve every kind of compliance problem or every problem of every workflow that a bank has no certainly not right human beings will still be solving vast majority of the problems but human beings can solve it at lesser cost and more efficient without you know beating their head against a wall, that is significantly high value, right? So that's a, a, an easy example from the financial services industry. Yeah, for sure. And I was also thinking like, as you described that, I don't know if this is feasible right now, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I could imagine with before too long, you could also have a setup where the quote unquote AI does a first pass of all that compliance stuff and flags some things, and let's say the client addresses 60, 70, 80% of that based on what got flagged, and then and then at some point, then the, the more experienced consultant comes in and you know cross-checks. But the point being like major either cost savings and either like l humans that don't have to do that or like you said, less experienced humans that are more affordable and less in demand. Like, cause the other problem of course, with really experienced people is not only that they're more expensive, they might not even be available because they're That's in demand the across projects. That, that is the point, right? It's not that it's not the unit expense. That is the problem. It's just, there are not enough of those human beings available, right? Yep. At any given point. So you can scale these things much more easily and have, you know, a more compliant system, without exponentially increasing the cost, right? And it's a, a much nicer experience as well, right? For everybody involved, both for the bank and for the compliance expert. Yeah, I was looking at, a, there was a study, I was trying to call it up, but it was on generative AI at work. And it's the most comprehensive study, I think, of generative AI in a, in a work context. It was done by uh, someone at MIT and also another university. I'll find the thing later. But but the thing that it resonated with exactly what you're saying, which was they found that the junior level of service employees were able to really elevate based on this same kind of scenario, right? Like a, an intelligent assistant 
um, you know, that kind of help. In this case, it's more, it's less about compliance and more about providing accurate information for customer, but same stuff, right? Elevating junior level people to be more effective. I think that's a really interesting use case. Yeah. And I'll give you a more technology friendly use case, right? So flipping from the business side to the tech side, I'm a programmer, which you know, right? The, yep. the you can think about two broad problems, right? You have a lot of programmers who are very good with um, what, let's say, the plumbing code, right? Things that hold things together, they're common across several problems. So things like, how do you log? How do you ensure security? How do you create a circuit breaker? So on and so forth, right? So that's one part of the code. And, you know, these are all, you know, mandated by architecture standards. And then there are developers who are very, very good at, um, you know, optimizing performance, business logic, things of that nature. Now, at the moment, right, in a classic development environment, you have to do all of this to, uh, for every program, right? Um, and then somebody, you know, human being has to go check whether all the architectural standards are already in the code, right? A, a quality engineering department exists for, for that and so on and so forth. Now, think about a more modern development approach, right, where all this glue code, right, the steps for, you know, unit test generation and logging and so on can be auto-generated anyway. And then the developers focus on just the differentiating parts of the code, right, on how you implement great business solutions. Tremendous help, right? So uh, AI as a you know, sidekick, right? A paired programmer for uh, a junior developer, significantly nicer than, you know, uh, what happens today where a junior developer has to learn a lot and can't keep up with technology and writes code that is not intellectually satisfying, right? How many times do you want to type logging code into into your program, right? I mean, it's... um, so do once use everywhere has been a, a, a thing forever, right? I mean, that's all programmers do that, right? The reusability thing. But what if you also have a co-pilot that helps you with all these things, right? So all the mundane things that a developer doesn't care about writing can be you know, done by an automated solution of which AI is a part. So now think about this in day-to-day development and then think about all these you know, old code that sits in assembler or... C++ and so on, which kind of pains me given, you know, my favorite language is C++. Um, but I know that not a lot of people code in C++ anymore, right? It's hard to be legacy sometimes, man. <laughs> but we got to have we gotta have pride, though. We got to yes, have pride. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm holding on to C++ and ABAP for that matter. Right? No so, doubt. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, right, if you have to convert code that sits on Assembler or COBOL or C++ or something, right? C++ is obviously way more modern than the other two. Um, But if you need to modernize it, uh, two problems. One, how do you understand the logic, right? The people who wrote it, I don't know, 50 years ago, right? Um, Are probably close to retirement or have already retired or sometimes not even alive anymore, right? So there is this big tech risk in the financial services industry that a lot of business logic sits in legacy environments that need to be modernized and, you know, it should be moved to a modern tech stack, Um, but pretty tough to do it manually, right? Even if you have the smartest programmers that you can find, just manually getting through that is a ton of effort and probably very risky as well. So... Uh, AI is a great solution. Generative AI is a great solution, right? You go read through that code and you can generate a modern tech stack. Maybe you can never generate 100% or even 80%. But let's say it can do 30% of the work. I mean, that is a significant you know, uh, value add than trying to do everything manually, right? Trying to do everything manually is a, is a dead end. Right? You, you never get through that, right? Because we are talking about tens or hundreds of millions of lines of code, right, in these legacy languages. So there are very valid use cases um, in, in enterprise, right, in, in these kinds of things. It also comes with interesting challenges, right, it's like some of which I have called out in my blog. For example, if you're, if you're generating code and you violate, you know, copyright, copyleft type situations, right, 
then you are exposing yourself to unnecessary risk right so the generative ai solutions they have to watch out for all of these things right so in a in a consumer world we don't care as much but in an enterprise world right you cannot expose a, a company using these solutions to that kind of exposure so um, you have to be careful right you have to use the right kind of data to train these systems and then um you know ideally the vendor will um, indemnify the, the the client right from um, uh, trouble that comes out of you know such exposure and so on so enterprise use cases come with a different nuance than um the the consumer side right it's a very different world in indeed and i think that risk profile is interesting because you've touched on a lot how you and i think Industries are going to vary in terms of how risk averse they are with generative AI based on compliance and, and that basically the stringency of how they could get punished if things go wrong. Yeah. Um, and you've noted this already. Um, Alteryx did a survey I'm writing about in a post where they, about 8,000 global respondents enterprise and about, you know, a bunch of them were surging ahead with the types of use cases you're describing, but a good 40%, 47% were holding off because of, concerns around data privacy and stuff like that. So there is a big risk mitig mitigation factor. Let me um, let me just run some things by you from my blog post, kind of like, which is sort of my chip on my shoulder about enterprise AI. And I want to kind of see what you agree with and how you feel about some of these things. So some of the risk factors, things like explainability, data privacy, IP, those things that need to get solved my personal feeling is that they are going to get solved. Now, I don't know whether chat GPT and those companies are going to solve them. That remains to be seen. Chat GPT now has an enterprise product, so time will tell. But I do believe that companies like IBM, for example, and other, you know, well-known, you know, enterprise tech companies are going to solve a lot of those problems over time. And, and be able to alleviate customer concerns around that. But I think there's some other things that are going to be more difficult to solve. One of them is bias. I'm sick of hearing vendors say that they've, that they're bias free AI. I don't think, I think bias can be reduced in these systems. I think eliminating bias is a very, very strong <laughs> assertion. Um, and so I'd like, like, love for you to weigh in on that. And in fact, I would rather see vendors talk more about how they're using these systems to challenge human bias. So instead of like trying to pretend they're bias free, why not think about challenging human bias? For example, exposing discriminatory hiring patterns through identification of various promotional patterns that occur in, 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 you know, in, in industry or whatever. But so I, I'd like to see more work on that. But um, the other thing is hallucinations. I'm, I'm sick of hearing companies, AI vendors say that they've solved the hallucination problem. Now, look, I, I can see that they might have solved the problem of insanely ridiculous stuff being said, right? Like, oh, go kill yourself. That sounds like a good idea. You're really tired. Like, I can see how guardrails can put be put into place so you can't get – so it's very difficult to get that kind of stuff to come out. But I'm sorry. These are large language models. They are not cognitive systems. They don't understand what they're saying. There is absolutely no way, in my opinion <laughs> – that you can completely assure that they're never going to put out something that's incorrect. I, I think, I think a, a much better strategy is to be honest about that and say how you're designing these processes so that humans can catch these problems when they do occur. Yeah. Let's it, hear what you have to say about that. So hallucination is more of a problem in a very large model, you know, that tries to do too many things, right? Right. Because, you have to remember, right, the underlying philosophy behind generative AI is not exactly reasoning like how a human being reasons. Now, it's a controversial topic. There are people who absolutely believe that um, an LLM can reason. Um, I have yeah. read probably 10 papers in the last two or three months. Um, generally, my belief is that it is not reasoning, or at least it's not reasoning like a human being reasons. Right. You can call it, well, again, you know, somebody, I'll, I'll land in trouble for saying this, but nevertheless, right? It's like a precision guessing um, algorithm, right? On right. what is the next thing that happens is what it's trying to guess, right? Based on, on tokens. Now, in a, an enterprise context, the 
model does not need to be that large, right? It, because it's not going to, to do right. too many things, right? It's built for very small um, contexts, and consequently, the chance of hallucination is pretty small. Enterprises have other things to worry about, right? Like, I mean, cost is a is a big big problem, right? So if you right. think about, um, you know, it's one of those few few times where have cost, uh, you know. We, I know we generally criticize, oh my God, they're like so cost conscious and you know try to do stupid things. But the reality is things take a lot of money. So training a system is, is, is a, a training a model is very expensive, right? Um, so it, think about it this way. Do you need a, a very large model that is very precise? Or would you take a, a smaller model, purposeful model, that probably is 5% less accurate than the humongous big model? but can operate at one-tenth less the cost, right? So enterprises will have to make those kinds of decisions all the time. Um, very different risk profile than the consumer side. But on the consumer side, I don't see hallucinations going away. There are, there are workarounds, right? So like you can teach the system to just stop short of not giving an answer, right? So if it answers, it gives a hallucinated answer, but you can say, for these, 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 these situations, right? The model will just say that I just don't want to answer, right? Or I will give a politically correct answer and I'm not going to give a real answer, right? I'll just give a, a vague answer and so on, right? So like your suicide question and so on. So that's the extent to which I think it'll it'll get mitigated. Right. So 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 just just for our listeners' interest there. There's a much broader scientific AI debate and discussion going on around this stuff. And initially, there was a there was an assertion, including OpenAI made this assertion, that simply by increasing the parameters of these models, they would overcome their deficiencies. Now, like the majority of people have backed off the idea that if you can just feed more and more information to these systems, you're going to solve these problems. In fact, you're making, I think, a more compelling argument, which is sort of the opposite, which is now you're hearing people like Altman talk more about specialized information and smaller data sets that are more focused to, to give a more reliable output. But there's still a broader debate going on which around this reasoning topic, which is essentially the debate is whether deep learning can can correct its problems and deficiencies within the field of deep learning or whether other forms of AI are going to be necessary to compensate for deep learning shortcomings. So, for example, cognitive systems and robotics and, and other types of AI disciplines that have things like spatial awareness and context and ability, perhaps even common sense, like, uh, you know, your guy, Dave, uh, what's the figure his last name? Watson founder is now involved in a startup now. Yeah. Um, you know, who, you know, Ferrucci, he's, he's working on this problem where he's trying to combine, um, deep learning with more cognitive systems and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff going on around this topic outside the enterprise context. And I happen to be one of the people that doesn't believe the deep learning can solve its own problems that I think it's going to need hybrid approaches, but that's sort of a debate for another time. What I'm kind of a little bit like frustrated about the moment is I think what we really need to focus on at the moment is, how far can we take this with the example you've chosen? I kind of call it the million dollar or billion dollar question, which is will industry specific LLMs further refined by individual customer data provide a superior level of output to the chat GPT type experience with this, which is trained on larger, but more generalized data sets and how just how superior can that output become? That's what I'm interested in VJ, because I, who cares if it's perfect as long as it's a hell of a lot better, right? And 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 I'm fascinated by this because the last time I talked with you, you talked with me about how confident you are that feeding these systems more focused bit, you know, bodies of information, like for example, a, a body of regulatory information, can yield a really powerful output for for c companies in that industry. And to me, that's where we should be putting our focus at the moment. The, the overall debate is really interesting, but to me, there's too much action now to figure out if this can actually be better. I, I'm more or less firmly convinced, you know, based on the last several months of, you know, client interactions and knowing what our own engineers are, are working on, that narrow models um, are far superior in achieving goals for enterprises uh, because most of the time enterprises don't need the consumer type applications, right? There are no scenarios where you need to answer a question on FDIC regulation and then have the same model 
create an essay, right, about your cat. That just since that's not a thing, right? So might as well focus on, you know, finding the business case on where you have the most revenue generation or most cost saving or whatever uh, business case holds, right, in your company and use very specific solutions. Um, there's like so much of low-hanging fruit in, in, in that category of solutions that for foreseeable future for the enterprise space, I think narrower use cases using generally smaller models, but highly cost efficient, highly performant and so on is a far superior solution, right? That's that's a camp I sit in. Yeah, in our phone call, you talked with me about uh, training such systems on like regulatory databases, kind of similar to the first example we discussed in this discussion, right? And like how powerful that can be for customers yeah. that are dealing with those regulatory. Correct. And it's also important that, you know, you value what your model does versus what a client's data does, right? Mm -hmm. The client's data belongs to the client, right? Not to the vendor. Uh, This is a a serious problem, right? You cannot, I mean, it's highly unethical, right? If you take a client's data, train your model, um, and then use that data uh, for someone else and make money out of it, right? It's not a, a particularly great thing to do. So that delineation should should always be there, right? That you respect what is a client's data and that you um, don't share, right? You're, you're not reckless with it. Um, so that, you know, like the fine tuning that happens, right? It's for a, a specific client and it should just be for them, right? This is like the, the crux of enterprise AI, right? That trust cannot be broken because if that's broken, then, you know, it, the enterprise AI is kind of dead at that point, right? It, it'll be a very fast, swift death to an exciting field. So, so this- one interesting challenge you, that we talked about, I talked about this with another data scientist who said, well, you don't want to do what you what VData just described because then you can't update your base model. But the last time we talked, you gave me the strong impression that that you could have a customer that had their own base model. Let's say it's industry-specific base model or whatever trained on their fine tuned with the model with their data and you can still up essentially update the base model as well. Yeah. Um, which means they're not, there's no model debt, if you will, right? Like that they can stay current, but still fine tune it. That's pretty powerful because typically when you in the, in the it managers head, they're thinking if I customize this, I can't upgrade it. Right. Because that's the classic paradigm. But in this case, it sounds like the, you could. Uh, there are things that will happen to a model, right? All models deteriorate over time, right? If you right. don't retrain the model, right, it will it will deteriorate over time. So that you know that's what's called drift, right? In the in, in a more technical yep. term. So you know, just like how a regular software has an ops functionality, right? There's observability for regular software when things go wrong, right? Performance goes bad, or you know, the memory allocation is not working as designed, so on. You get to know these things up front, right? And then you can, you know, provide solutions, right? Either self-healing or some human being fixes something. That kind of a paradigm exists for machine learning as well, right? What's called MLOps. I think it is probably the most exciting part of machine learning for near future. Because that's key, right? Because these are probabilistic things, right? This is not yes or no type of things, right? So you do need to know any application that uses a machine learning model behind the scenes. It needs to have the sophistication to know whether this model is drifting and whether it can you know, come back to a more useful state and so on. Because otherwise, the people using it will soon lose trust in the system right? very, very quickly. And God forbid, you know, do um, really bad things too, right? Like um, bias and other problems that we spoke about, right? These things all, if you... Uh, observe in time and and fix it right and and stop that drift no problem but that means that you know the excitement we have about the innovation that happens with gen ai needs to be coupled with that governance aspect right and without governance nothing survives in enterprise even like erp systems right you throw a lot of junk in eventually you know you search for a customer and you get like 17 answers for that customer, right? Then pretty quickly, you know, people lose interest in that ERP system. That same concept applies in a slightly different way to machine learning as well. That if you don't take care of, you know, the governance, uh, that garbage in, garbage out, right? It just 
comes and hits you in really nasty ways. And this is a high investment thing, right? You spend a billion dollars putting in this very sophisticated model, then you don't govern it, right? It deteriorates really fast and it kills value. Right. And I'll point out to listeners, I'll have a link in the description with your blog post because you got into ML ops and some of these related topics in more detail in your blog as well. And I think those are really, really important points. I want to build up to a crescendo in our discussion around pricing controversies. But before I do that, one more extension on this sort of this sort of million dollar question that I've phrased is, is the role of the customer in things like reinforcement learning, the participation of domain experts in refining the model and stuff like that. In your opinion, is there some human expertise needed to help fine tune these systems that inside the customer domain, or are these systems effective enough that, that, that you don't need a whole lot of that outside perhaps the customer data itself? No, you do need people, right? And you need people to look at that data, you know, do better prompt engineering, so on and so forth. It's not in a shape where it's plug and play. Um, I mean, you can enable plug and play to some extent. Like, for example, you know, if a software vendor, like an ERP vendor or a CRM vendor, right, uh, incorporates AI as a platform component and it uses the same metadata and same security, same workflows and so on, yeah, a lot of that effort, you know, can be automated. But beyond the elementary use cases, right, it still needs significant human effort. And uh, high, and that is that that skills angle is a is a complicated problem, you know. Much like um, in rest of technology, this is a pretty nascent field. I mean, there are plenty of people who understand machine learning to to some degree, as in who can apply machine learning, but not deep experts. And then Gen AI itself is still fairly new and, you know, we are still learning for the most part, right? A lot of research is going on and so so on. So keeping yourself upskilled and uh, picking up new new uh, abilities, that's a, a, a big factor, both for clients and for vendors, right? This is a, a, a critical, critical aspect. I, I expect, you know, for the next three, five years, right, that uh, that education will become like a mainstream topic. And skills is in your blog post as well. Another plug. Uh, but, but in terms of a successful project, a successful sort of launch project with a customer, what is the key participation you need from them from a skills perspective? Is it domain, domain experts helping to validate the prompts and stuff like that? Yeah, it's largely domain expertise, right? And, mm -hmm. and managing the change. So if at all there is, uh, like one make or break, um, not just for Gen AI, but you know AI in general, people don't take kindly to probability um, functions. Right? They don't understand it. People understand binary answers way more, you know, yes or no kind of Boolean answers way more than they understand 60% chance of this happening and so on, or the score of 0 0.805 means very little to people, right? So the change management that happens um, is tremendous. I mean, think about the HR use case that I said. My own default behavior was to first call my HR partner, right? Not to go check out a chatbot, right? So it cannot be underestimated, you know, the amount of um, change management that is needed before this thing, you know, becomes mainstream. So those two things, skills and change management would be like the top two things I would point out. Right. So now let's briefly hit on the pricing controversy because I see really two directions enterprise vendors going in right now. One is some are kind of rushing to charge a premium for AI, generative AI services. I understand some of the impulse behind that because these systems are not cheap to run. And if you can provide value, then sure, charge. But I land more on the side that I think these initial projects are, are going to require some experimentation on use cases. Based on what we discussed, I think they're going to require customer participation on the domain expert level. I think they're going to require fine-tuning models with customer data. And i just having a hard time. I'm more in the camp of the vendors that are saying, we're not going to overcharge our customers while they're actively participating in the co-creation of AI value. <laughs> so that's kind of where I land. I think it's interesting because I think it comes down to how much this stuff shines out of the box. But I don't see how you can ask your customers to help you fine-tune and create value and then charge them for it. Maybe I'm missing. So help me out, Vijay. 
No, so I, I, I think you're right, right? It's it's tough. The, the vendors obviously are all you know, profit motive companies, nothing wrong with that. So, so are their clients, right? So they do need to make some money and, you know, uh, generative AI is a sophisticated technology. So which means they have to spend tremendous amount of uh, money on, on R&D to, to get it in there. Um, it's a question of how much is the customer participation? So think about like ERP, right? ERP needed, um, a size and the clients and so on also, right, to, to put in a lot of effort to um, get a system up and running. And that played a part in how much is the software itself actually actually worth mm-hmm. and how much is the size effort worth and how much is the internal effort worth. Gen AI is so new that we haven't had the time and data, right, to figure out where that boundary is. But anything that the client is actively driving should be discounted from the price is what i i think right it's um because you know they they are also investing in this and you know i'm sure there will be good commercial constructs like you know first 100 clients right uh, maybe contributing to making the system better and they get a price break or something right, right. so those are all commercial decisions but in general you know, I would like to see a scenario where enterprise-wide, the client's data is uh, respected and, you know, not compromised and, and people build with trust. I think clients will pay vendors more if they are assured that, you know, they are indemnified against uh, wrong usage, you know, that there is, you know, responsible, trusted AI in place. That carries a premium because the risk of not having it, right, is, is just too high. So that is a way that I would establish a premium, not not by just rushing in and saying that I have cool new functionality. You still need to do a lot to make it work, but I will also charge you an arm and a leg. I think that's a piss poor policy. Indeed. But to your point, if you create meaningful value for customers, then I think all options are on the table. So I, I think these things can be sorted out. I just I just think it's a fascinating debate. I'm not saying there's one right answer on how no, to do it. No, there is no right answer. But, plus, I think it will evolve over time. Right? Yeah. I mean, Everybody is trying to figure out right how to, how to make this work. So I think a, a little bit of flailing will happen in the short term. Before we wrap up, I do want to give you a chance to comment on the bias thing because I kind of blasted through that. And, and I know that that you're passionate about making sure that these systems are inclusive and fair. So, you know, what is your take on, on how we, we minimize bias throughout the process of implementing and executing on, on generative AI and AI in general? Yeah. Uh, super complicated topic, right? So yeah, I, we could do a whole show on it. So yeah, I, I realize I'm giving it short shrift, but anyhow. Uh, the general answer is you can only mitigate, right? You cannot eliminate bias. So, and bias comes in many forms. Right? The model itself might be biased. There's bias in the data. There's bias in the mind of the people using it or creating it. Right. So this is not like, like you know, you use recruiting as an example. If you train um, a system based on hist- historic recruiting data across this country, you can only expect that it will be heavily biased. Right. And then right. URMs and you know women and and so on. Right. Will all get discriminated against. So that's a terribly bad outcome to have. So it needs to be mitigated. But the good thing is you can detect and quantify bias, right? And uh, statistical ways of doing it. So you can mitigate, it's tough to eliminate. But again, this also needs a ton of change management to go with it, right? Just because a model said something, right? You also have to work on correcting that model, right? Telling the model whether that answer was good, bad, or indifferent, right? So there is some effort in in tuning that model towards a, a better place. So that effort and the change that it drives in the organization uh, are tough. Because human beings are still human beings. Just because AI said something, right, doesn't mean that we change our fundamental belief systems. So I think a lot of onus is on the non-software part of bias, um, right, where human behavior needs to be managed. That's the real leadership challenge, right? So I, I don't think technology by itself will, will get us to a, a better place. Technology can help the good techniques available to do this, but uh, that's definitely not underestimated the human effort required, right? The leadership required to, to make this work. Right. And, um, and I, I butchered Dave Ferrucci's last name. So it's spelled Ferrucci and his company is called, uh, elemental cognition, interesting startup that's just gotten a bunch of cash. And he's, like I said, he's looking to combine different types of AI 
which is a really interesting challenge. Um, VJ, we're, we're basically out of time. Was there anything that, that you wanted to touch on that we missed? No, that, this was wonderful. I think we, we should not wait for another four years before we get to do this again. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is how I learn and it's such a great opportunity to talk about these things. So thank you so much for the time. Absolutely. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you, John.